I guess that makes me the devil. <laughs> you are. She is. She is the devil. I'm in hell. I'm burning. Help me. You shouldn't joke about that. Hey there, Monster Maniacs. It's Josh from Channeling Spirits, a special guest star in this apocalyptic period. The devil. He is one half of the dichotomy resting on our shoulders. I'm going to lead you down the path that rocks. The devil is stereotypically depicted as having crimson skin, horns, goat legs, wings, and a pitchfork or trident. But why the hell did we pick those features? Join us as we journey deep into the history of the Emperor of Evil and find out where he came from, how he got his many names. Most unclean. and why we ascribe such strange features to him. Before we begin, there are several things we need to address. Depending upon the denomination, several versions of the Bible exist that differ in what book should be considered canonical. We will not be detailing every reference to the devil, but highlighting counters of particular importance. It's also important to state that the Bible was written by multiple authors and has been edited and translated multiple times. We will attempt to use the earliest versions of the text to infer the author's original intent. And here we go! To begin, we must start with the etymology of the word Satan. Uh, it's Satin, actually. Got it. The original Hebrew word Satan translates to adversary or any being who stands opposed to. This word appears multiple times throughout the Hebrew Bible and is applied to both humans and divine beings. King Solomon refers to both Hadad, the Edomite, and Rezan, son of Eliad, as a Satan or an adversary, who is said to be raised up by Yahweh against him. David refers to the sons of Zeruiah as Satans, just as he is called a Satan by the Philistines. While all of these are terrestrial adversaries, the Old Testament also describes divine beings that way. An angel of Yahweh stands opposed to Balaam when he disregards God's instructions. Modern English translations of the book of Job and Zechariah often use Satan with a capital S, but in the original Hebrew, it is Hasatan. This definitive article should be translated as the adversary or the accuser, and not as a proper name. What's your name? Satan. I don't call myself the Josh, so these modern versions are incorrect. In the book of Zechariah, a high priest is on trial in a divine court. Standing before him are an angel of Yahweh, and to his right, Hasatan, or the accuser. Yahweh rebukes the adversary, but it isn't clear if this being is an angel, allegory, or something else. <laughs> the term Hasatan also appears in the book of Job. The sons of Yahweh come before him, and so did the Satan. Yahweh asks the Satan, where have you come from? The Satan explains he has been roaming the earth, and the discussion turns to a pious and wealthy man, Job. The Satan posits the only reason Job is pious is because of his wealth, and Yahweh allows the Satan to take everything from Job but his life. Again, the text doesn't specify what Hasatan is or who he is an adversary to. We can assume his position is to be the idea of piety coming from prosperity, but he is still subservient to Yahweh. Satan, as the personification of evil, doesn't exist in the Jewish tradition. The closest concept is Yetzer Hara, which is the inclination to do evil by going against Yahweh's will. The term appears twice in Genesis, chapter 6, verse 5, and chapter 8, verse 21, but not in reference to or derived from a specific being. In 1 Samuel, chapter 16, verses 14 through 23, Yahweh sends an evil spirit to torment King Saul, which allows David to be introduced to the king. This spirit executes the plan of Yahweh, although the evil nature is by design of the Creator. In 1 Kings, chapter 22, verse 19 through 25, it describes Yahweh sitting on a throne with the hosts of heaven surrounding him. He asks those in his presence who will entice Ahab into attack, and a spirit answers saying he will be the deceiving spirit in the mouths of prophets. Again, this deception is a tool of the Jewish God of creation. There is one creature in the Jewish Bible that openly defies the will of Yahweh, the serpent in the Garden of Eden. When it was written, the serpent was not analogous with the devil. Instead, it was a cunning creature who could speak and did not resemble our modern snakes. Whether the serpent is overtly evil or merely a metaphor for temptation is subject to debate. He corrects Eve that touching the fruit will not kill her and claims that eating it will make her like Yahweh. Look, but don't touch. Touch, but don't taste. Several cultures have mythical snakes that embody chaos or evil. 
Apep is a massive serpent that attempts to devour Ra, the Egyptian god of the sun. Typhon is a giant beast with several serpentine elements who fathered many classic monsters of Greek mythology. Jormungandr, the world serpent of Nordic traditions, is said to poison the skies during Ragnarok. So if early biblical writings did not have a single prince of darkness, but rather a name to describe any adversary, how did those concepts become the devil we know? While there isn't definitive evidence, certain scholars theorized Judaism was influenced by Zoroastrianism. While a portion of the Jewish population was held captive in Babylon, the city was conquered by the Persians in 539 BCE. In Isaiah chapter 45, verse 7, which was composed during or after the exile, their deity was simply a creator. I am Yahweh unrivaled. I form the light and create the dark. I make good fortune and create calamity. It is I, Yahweh, who do all this. It is responsible for both the good and evil of the world, but Persians believe their creator, Ahuru Mazda, existed in light and virtue above, while Angra Menu, the embodiment of evil, dwelled below in darkness. Ahura Mazda created the first man and all that is good in the world, including divine, subordinate creatures. In turn, Angra Menu created demons and foul creatures like snakes and flies to match each animal, but he could not create an equal to man. Instead, man was inflicted with suffering and death, and the internal struggle, good versus evil, began. The idea of an external figure being responsible for humankind's strife rather than the internal failing seems to become a more popular idea later in history. This might account for the serpent becoming synchronized with the embodiment of evil. But moral dualism was not the only idea that found its way into Abrahamic religions. The concept of angels and demons as supernatural beings who are subservient to an omnibalevolent or omnimalevolent being may have well derived from Zoroastrianism. The afterlife is another concept that appears to be influenced from the Persians. The idea of a Jewish afterlife is varied, and one of the earliest ideas was that of Sheol, an underground place of darkness where the dead dwelt. The word paradise is originated from Paridiza, an Iranian word for walled garden. During the Second Temple era, this paradise became associated with the Garden of Eden, which was prophesied to be restored. Zoroastrianism has a climatic final battle of good versus evil, where a savior, immaculately conceived, will raise the dead. The story is rather similar to the Book of Revelations, which modern Christians also ascribe as the ultimate end. But Zoroastrianism would only be the beginning for the devil. There is another famous verse from Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which dis weaken the nations? While the word Lucifer conjures strong feelings in our modern world, the original context was a sardonic epithet towards a Babylonian king. In the entire Hebrew Bible, this is the only mention of Lucifer, but it wasn't referring to Satan. The original Hebrew word is Hallel, meaning shining one. A more appropriate translation of that verse is, how you are fallen from heaven, shining one, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, you who are weakened to the nations. So if you were to take shining one and son of the morning, that might be where morning star came from. This is probably where the translators for the Latin Vulgate chose Lucifer, meaning the planet of Venus or morning star. This passage from Isaiah was later linked with Luke chapter 10, verse 18. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. The Gospel of Luke was originally written in Greek and used the word Satanan, which was likely referring to the Hebrew adversary, but the author's intention for the word is up to interpretation. However, with Lucifer and Satan both falling from heaven, it led to believe that they were the same creature. This fall likely also brought on the belief he was once an angel. However, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14 contends he was truly an angel. At the time when the Gospels were being recorded, the idea of Satan was continuing to evolve. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus of Nazareth is tempted by the devil. The author uses both Satanin, adversary, and Diabolu, meaning slanderer. The author of Matthew gives Diabolu a definite article making it the slanderer. You ain't right, man. Oh, I'm right. He's got a point. These were more descriptors of the unnamed tempter who is not explicitly a demon. In fact, the author uses both Diabolu and demonia. The Latin Vulgate translation would use Diablo, still meaning slanderer, but it would eventually become a title or name in English as devil. Demonia 
originally meaning pagan gods, would be translated later in English to demons or devils. You are worse than humans. You're worse than demons, and yet you claim to be gods. The author of Matthew specifically names Beelzebub as the prince of demons. Like Demonia, Beelzebub was originally a pagan deity of the Philistines, Baalzebub, who was turned into a malevolent spirit by early Christians. While the Gospel of Matthew conflated Satan and the devil, Oh, I have so many names. I am the devil, Satan, Lucifer, Beelzebub, the prince of darkness. The book of Revelation would also make him the red dragon and serpent of old in Genesis. In the apocryphal Book of Wisdom, chapter 2, verse 24 states, But by the envy of the devil, death entered the world, and they who are allied with him experience it. This may be where we get the narrative of Satan being jealous of Adam and Eve and why he tempts the couple. This matches his role as the tempter of Jesus and a force that challenges the Christian Savior. Thus, he becomes the perfect adversary in the book of Revelation and once again dons a serpentine appearance. This is one of the first descriptions we have of the devil, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on these heads. The work also mentions angels aligning with him, but does not confirm he is an angel. Evidence of that is found in Second Enoch, another apocryphal work which details the landscape of heaven and expands the creation story. On the second day, Yahweh created the hosts of heaven, and among them an angel who looked into place his throne higher than the clouds and be equal to Yahweh. He is cast out with his angels and was forced to fly in the air continuously above the bottomless. The angel is named Sataniel, which is Hebrew means adversary of God, and he conspires to tempt Adam. It is noted Satan becomes different from the angels being aware of his sin and seeks to seduce Eve. With the origin and nature of the devil becoming fleshed out, his image would also begin to take shape. Like other demonia, several horned deities of nearby religions were turned into malicious beasts. Malak was a Canite god, and Balal Haman was the chief god of Carthage. Baal Haman was associated with fertility and the ram. He was worshipped as Baal Kormain in North Africa and Carthage. The horned Baal and Moloch became associated with child sacrifice in the Hebrew Bible. Baal Haman may also have a syncretic association to Amun, a Libyan Egyptian god which would be later worshipped by the Greeks. The god was represented with the head of a ram, considered a symbol of virility from their rutting behavior. The deity's popularity led him to be associated with Zeus as Zeus Amon and Amun-Ra. Amunet, Amun-Ra, conjoined. This is a spell foretelling the annihilation of man and the coming of the beast. In addition to the falsely worshipped golden calf, another horned creature is the sacrificial goat or scapegoat in Leviticus. The original Hebrew word is Azazel, which became the name of a demon. Rival gods and animal sacrifices all had one common trait, horns. I'm also a horny devil. But it wouldn't be the end for horned creatures to be depicted maliciously in Abrahamic texts. The book of Revelation has the creature of the sea and earth, both bearing horns. In the 19th century, Eliphas Levi, an occultist, published a pseudo-history on Baphomet, slanderously claiming the Knights Templar worshipped it as a god. The truth is, occult in Mendez revered an Egyptian ram deity named Benemdejed. Levi mixed the Tarot of Marseille devil card with Benemdejed and called it Baphomet of Mendes. The popular idea of a horned, winged, and goat-legged beast was further cemented. The pagan god Pan, a half-goat satire, is often attributed with the devil's carnal desires. The image of a trident is likely also from Greek sources. While Poseidon possessed a trident, Hades was known for his bident. As a god of the underworld, this may have been where the devil got his pitchfork. By appropriating the images of pagan gods, they could construct a figure of absolute evil, which disparaged other competing deities. Interestingly, Matthew chapter 3, verse 12, describes Yahweh metaphorically using a similar instrument. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. It became popular in medieval art to portray angels with feathery wings so naturally fallen angels were shown to have feathery wings. In Dante's Inferno, Satan possesses bat-like wings. He is a massive beast, 
frozen in the lowest pit of hell, and flapping his wings only further freezes him in ice. Satan is horrifyingly ugly, with three faces and one head. Each mouth gnashes at a great traitor, Judas, Brutus, and Cassius. Depictions throughout history would waver between the devil being hideous and handsome. Up to this point, Lucifer was largely a one-dimensional character. He was envious of Adam, which brought about his fall, but also the embodiment of temptation and any evil plaguing mankind. John Milton in his magnus opus, Paradise Lost, gave a great amount of depth and sympathy for the devil. Milton crafts a character of charisma, arrogance, and incredible rhetoric. John Baptiste Medina's illustrations would echo the visual tropes we have discussed. What is interesting is both epic poems have Satan trapped in hell, yet many believe he openly walked the earth. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, the devil is prowling, looking for someone to devour. In fact, only the book of Revelation has him in the lake of fire and brimstone. For many, the devil was an actual threat roaming the countryside. The idea of a deal-making demon may have come as early as the Satan in Job, but there were several early stories. Archbishop Hinkmar of Reims wrote in 860 of a boy looking to court a girl who signed a contract renouncing Christ to win her affections. There is the famous tale of Faust, a scholar who offers his soul to Mephistopheles for his earthly services. Theatrical interpretations of Mephistopheles is where the popular image of a man with black hair, a widow's peak, thin mustache, and a goatee become a symbol of the devil. Satan has become a folklore character, sometimes tricked by a more cunning protagonist. Cartoons and products in the early 20th century playfully portrayed him with the cliches we have mentioned, a scarlet appearance, horns, cloven hooves, wings, and a pitchfork. Modern interpretations occasionally harken back to that. Most often he was merely human, handsome in appearance and often in a suit. Nowadays the devil doesn't dwell in hell, nor does he walk the earth. He is merely our dark reflection. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. Who knows what form the Prince of Darkness will take on next? This video was a beast. So if you like this video and think we deserve it, they call me master. Wait till you see what I'm gonna call you. Please subscribe. And if you're in the position to help, please support us on Patreon and keep coming back for more spectacular videos. And I do apologize to any of you theologians out there if I did mispronounce some of these old Hebrew words. I can't help it. The devil made me do it. <laughs> I'm Josh from Channeling Spirits, and thanks for watching.